Thanks for joining me once again. Tonight, we are going to talk about the Bible. Uh, the last time we talked about the Word of God, how everyone's interpretation can be different, and that's okay. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the Bible, and we're going to still talk about some different interpretations of that. And I just found this so fascinating, and I'm sure some of you out there have to also be questioning things. But that's a good thing. If you're not questioning anything, that means you're not thinking about it. And the more you think about something, the more you should have questions about it. And we have to remember that God is the one we need to seek the answers from. So let me read, so let me read the meditation, the Bible to you. Consider one of our most beloved brothers, the late Billy Graham, who introduced countless millions to the good news. In an interview conducted in 1997, Billy Graham made the following statement regarding salvation, which he still holds to. I think everybody that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts that they need something that they don't have. And they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. Many have since publicly declared Billy Graham a heretic because of his beliefs regarding salvation that they don't line up with their interpretation of what they think the Bible teaches us. And in essence, what Billy Graham is saying is that somebody, he's thinking that salvation, and um, of course salvation here, I'll read this, salvation is deliverance from harm, redemption from the power of sin. What he's saying is even if somebody is not aware or knows Jesus Christ, I looked it up, I actually found that he was talking to, was it Robert Schuller? I wanted to make sure that this was a legitimate story before I just started blurting it out. But apparently he's talking about people who may be Hindus or who might uh, have grown up in a different culture, but they do believe in God. So this is what Billy Graham is saying. He's thinking that even if they haven't heard the name of Christ, even if they haven't been taught about Christ, but they know that there is a God and they know that there's something more. He is referring to these people. And of course, many people believe that is heresy. There again, it's his interpretation of the Bible. So who knows, who knows? It says, many have since publicly declared Billy Graham a heretic because of his beliefs regarding salvation don't line up with their interpretation of what they think the Bible teaches. Are we to call our Southern Baptist brother a heretic because his interpretation of the Bible differed from our own. Does our father now stand in condemnation of his son, Billy, who clearly loved the gospel of Yeshua, who is Jesus? Dare we suggest that Billy now suffers for what we think was a false belief? Seeing such disparity of interpretations of the written word, how are we to interpret the Holy Scriptures? When Genesis tells us that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, did he literally have two legs to walk in a literal garden, or is the creation story a parable of origin and separation? Is the Spirit of God actually a great spinning wheel in the heavens as Ezekiel saw him in Ezekiel 1 verse 16, or was this metaphorical? Do angels still ride in chariots as seen by the prophet Elijah? You find that in Kings chapter 6, verse 17. Did they ever actually do so? Or was this vision simply presented in the imagery that Elijah could understand so long ago? Is the book of Revelation a prophetic declaration of literal events still to come, as some theologians say? Or is it a grand metaphorical analogy describing something that happens in each of our lives, as other scholars claim? Or is it both? Who knows? Did the, great, did the great apostasy that Paul wrote about to the Thessalonians happen when Christianity returned to the systems of fear and law in the 4th and 5th centuries? Or is that great turning away something yet to come? Or is it both? Is the second coming of Christ a radical coming of Christ revelation and manifestation in the hearts of all over a brief time? 
or is it going to be a physical one-time event where Jesus actually floats down from the sky? Or is it both? Does Yeshua still have a body like ours today? Or is it glorified so totally unlike ours? Or does he only show himself to some as a body like God revealed himself as a wheel within a wheel to Ezekiel? Or is it all of these? Who experiences hell? And is it a literal place or an experience beyond space and time, thus classified as eternal? Or is it the experience of separation from God in this life? Or is it all of these? We don't know. How are we to answer all of these questions? Yes, perhaps, maybe not, of course, of course not, I'm not sure. These questions are not the ones we fight over or die for in this book. Dogmatism, let's look that word up, dogmatism. I've looked it up before. I think it's just a set of religious beliefs, but let's look it up here and see. Dogmatism, definition. A principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true. So that would be like somebody saying, there's no disagreeing with this. This dogma is, this is what it is. You believe it or you don't, but what I'm saying here is right. And that's what I'll These questions are not the ones we fight over or die for in this book. Dogmatism has spawned enough fear and grievance. And fear uh, itself denies the very Christ that it seeks to defend. The interpretations of scholars according to the traditions of man's intelligence have no end. I too, and this is uh, uh, Ted Decker, I too have a degree in theology but that doesn't make my interpretations any more valid than those who do not. Just because someone has a degree in theology doesn't mean they know everything. It doesn't mean that God has given them all knowledge. God hasn't given any of us all knowledge. That's why we keep seeking. Our lives, not our arguments, are the evidence of love. And love is the evidence of all who have awakened to Christ. Let us humble ourselves and realize that in many ways, intellectually speaking, we are like ants on the side of a computer, arguing over how the processor works, the processor being God. So it's rather silly to call the other ants foolish because we too are surely as foolish in many ways. So we can't always point the finger at somebody else. We're foolish too. We like our dogma too. So. Rather, we stand in awe of the glory of our Father and know Him in love. And we stand in awe of His creation and know all we encounter in that same love. How then are we to interpret the scripture? First and foremost, through the lens of true love. Because once again, any interpretation of scripture that doesn't lead us to love is likely leading us to something other than Christ. So what he's saying here, if scripture is leading you to not be loving or to love, it's probably not leading you to Christ. It's not who Christ is. And we do so in humility, each of us willing to be led by the Holy Spirit rather than by our own reasoning based upon what we were taught. We gotta be led by the Holy Spirit. If, if something seems off, if something seems different than what we were taught and you feel it in your soul, you feel it in your spirit that that's not right, most likely it's not. We, like Paul, long to know Christ and the staggering power of his resurrection. And as those who have risen with him, to know the power of our own resurrection in him, not as a doctrinal statement or interpretation that satisfies the intellect, but as a reality that empowers us to love as Christ loves. It's all about love, folks. In my opinion, and there again, you can have your own, but in my opinion, it's all about love. If we don't know love, if we don't know how to share love, if we aren't loving, if we aren't kind, if we don't feel sympathy for others, empathy for them, if we don't feel the need to reach out and help and touch someone, if we don't pray for others and lift them up, pray for what's best for them, if we hold on to unforgiveness, if we are jealous or if we're angry all the time, we're not focused on Jesus. We're kind of 
Jesus doesn't leave us. It's just we're not focused on him. We're focused on the world. And we need to stop that. We need to be solely focused on Jesus Christ, who is all about love. So once again, if you don't agree with somebody on what uh, they believe the Bible is saying, that's okay. It's okay. You don't have to. Just focus on God. Focus on Jesus. Focus on love. And guess what? You can't go wrong with that. doesn't matter what anyone else tells you. You can't go wrong. When you love, you can't go wrong. That's what it's all about. So bow with me for a word of prayer. I thank you, Lord, for the gift of love. Lord, help me be a disciple of yours. Help me follow your way. And your way is all about loving you and loving others. And we can't love others, Lord, unless we love you. You are the author of love. You are the giver of life. And life begins once we know you and once we love others. Thank you for being there for us. Thank you for never leaving us. And thank you for giving us your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving us his spirit, which lives in each and every one of us. And I just pray, Lord, that everyone out there knows you, that they know who you are, that they trust in you, that they don't have to trust in man, but they do. Do, Lord, get to know you and that their lives be changed forever. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Thank you. And thank you for joining me for these two meditations from Ted Decker. Remember, this is part two, so go back if you haven't watched part one and see that. And I'll see you next week on Dee's Delights.